Thank you for listening to the Monday American Podcast. In order to let you know how much we appreciate you listening, we're doing a giveaway for our audience. So before we begin this final part of the Korean War series, let's go ahead and go over the details of how you can win some sweet, sweet free podcast gear. The contest is going to be open to anyone, regardless of how long you've been listening to the podcast for, and there's no real annoying task that makes you jump through hoops in order to be eligible for um, a drawing. All you have to do is go to the website, themondayamerican.com, go to the contact page, or you can just click on the link in the show notes of this episode, which will take you right to the spot you need to go for the drawing. But on that page, there is a contact form to send an email or a message to us. Fill that out with your name and email, and the only requirement you have to be entered into the contest, and I'll explain why in a second, it'll make more sense, is write in the message field what part or what era of American history is your favorite or is the most interesting to you. If you want to include why that one is the most interesting, by all means, do so, but you don't need to. And the reason we want your favorite era is because of the prizes that we're giving out. There's going to be multiple winners, and they'll include stickers, t-shirts, gift cards, um, a bunch of great stuff. But there will be a couple of, I guess you could say, grand prize winners that will get a shirt, stickers, and the cherry on top is that these couple winners will get a book on American history that yours truly is going to curate and choose for them based on their interest and the part of American history that they put down in the message. So you'll have a book coming to you for you that I've read and chosen specifically just for you. The winners of this competition will be announced on a Facebook video where we will draw the winners' names out of a hat on the video, and you can watch that on our Facebook page once we do it. If you don't already follow or like our Facebook page, just search for The Monday American on Facebook or click the link in this episode's show notes to go straight there. If you don't watch the video, we will also announce the names of the winners in the next episode posted after this one just in case you aren't able to watch the video or you don't have Facebook. Again, thank you so much for listening to this podcast, for spreading the word, and for supporting the show. If you're able to leave a rating or review in whatever app you're listening to the show on right now, that would help us out tremendously. It helps us to be found more easily for people who don't know about the show yet. And I think that wraps up all the housekeeping issues. So I hope you enjoy the third and final episode of the Korean War series. You're listening to The Monday American. It's interesting to me that all wars are so unique in their own right, but they also have themes that are cross-communicative through all of them. Like, you know, the hellish nature of battle or what it's like to fight in close quarters. Those kind of things typically translate from war to war. And of course, each one has its own little unique markings on that style or that niche of the theme. But there's things that are extremely similar or things that war relies upon. And what I'm getting at here is that one of the aspects of war you simply can't have a war without is leadership. And in the Korean War, leadership was one of the central issues for why it turned out the way it did. And it was really a situation that everyone lost in. But the failure of leadership in this war specifically, it led to tragedy. And it can be all centered around what it takes to be a leader or what it means to really lead, whether it's on the battlefield or, or even in a business or in your own life, leadership demands certain qualities and demands certain requirements in order to be successful in it. And one of the interesting requirements of successful military leadership is that it has a dependency on the leader to be prideful in a certain manner, not necessarily prideful in the negative sense that you think of it, but self-respect or pride that kind of runs together. If you don't have self-respect or 
pride in what you're doing, you will not be a successful leader. And a lot of that revolves around character. In a book called Conversations with Dick Winters, which is written by Major Dick Winters, I think he retired as a higher rank. I don't have that in front of me right now. I apologize. I mean, no disrespect. But Dick Winters, if you've seen Band of Brothers, he's the major, he's the one of the main characters in that series, and he's largely regarded as one of the greatest military leaders, certainly in our nation's history, and if not the world's military history. But he said in this book about leadership and character, he said, quote, Character revolves around doing the right thing all the time. Character implies daily choices of right over wrong. The cadet prayer at West Point says cadets strive to choose the harder right instead of the easier wrong and never to be content with a half truth when the whole truth can be won. That gets to the heart of character. I like to think of character as every other virtue at the breaking point. And character is something that the military leadership of the United Nations or the United States higher command was lacking. I mean, consider that they're they're altering intelligence just to get an outcome that is favorable to what they want to happen or that fits into the narrative of what they want to believe about the situation in front of them. General Douglas MacArthur, while he did have success on many different battlefields and he was a great military commander as far as strategy planning and pulling off some maneuvers, he was a man that lacked character because you can't tell me that a man who gets his subordinates to alter information just to fit into this alter universe reality that he's created is a character role model. And one of the main reasons that he was not successful as a leader in this war was that he allowed the wrong type of pride, which is pride without self-respect, really, to dictate his actions. So he was coming at this whole war with a vanity type of pride rather than self-respect or being proud of his, his army as a whole. And in that book, Dick Winters continues to say, quote, The first and most important thing is I've got my own conscience to answer to. I won't think of doing anything to bring discredit to my outfit, my paratrooper boots and wings, the airborne patch, or the U.S. Army. And if you had flipped that quote to apply it to Douglas MacArthur at the time, it would have been the first and most important thing I've got is to worry about my own reputation and image. His priorities were out of line. Dick Winters continued on pride and self-discipline, saying, quote, Self-discipline keeps you doing your job. Without it, you lose your pride and forget the importance of self-respect in the eyes of your fellow men. Pride keeps you going on. This is what I feared I would lose, a loss of the will to measure up to my men. In General Douglas MacArthur, he didn't have that will. He lost that will to measure up to his men. He saw it as the men had to measure up to him. And I think it's very well surmised by a ex-Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink, and he has his own podcast. If you don't listen to it, you should. It's called The Jocko Podcast. J-O-C-K-O. And Jocko was talking about this idea of leadership and the qualities it takes to be a successful leader. And he said about this whole leadership and war thing, quote, I think war is more of an amplifier than a creator. I think it amplifies good character and amplifies bad character. I think it amplifies issues in either direction. It's a powerful element to add into people's lives. This big, intense peace. And what he's saying is that you don't change because of the war. The war amplifies who you already are. Dick Winters basically said the same thing when he said, quote, War doesn't alter character. War merely brings out the best that an individual has to offer. Unfortunately, it also brings forth the worst in some men. If anything, war exposes the best and worst of those who are called to fight. I know of no man who lacked character and peace and then discovered character in combat. And when you think about all the tragedies of this war and what has happened in the story so far, it's a lack of character choices from the top down to the men who make the final decision that are responsible for creating those tragedies. But on the flip side, you also have stories that 
where men receive direct orders and they decide to be insubordinate and to disobey them because they have character and they know that's not the right thing to do. And it's this dichotomy of back and forth, good and bad character that has plagued the Korean War so far. And to pick up the story where we left off, you'll remember that the Chinese attacked the United Nations and United States forces, and suddenly they found that they had an entirely new war on their hands. Now, General MacArthur, he was so prideful in his own reputation that he was outraged at the communist defiance as he saw it. And he actually labeled it a criminal act. And he was incredibly sincere in his threats of retaliation to unleash the full strength of the United States military. The way he saw it, he, he thought that these Chinese criminals, they should be punished. He thought they should be bombed and harassed and that their war-making potential would be destroyed for decades to come. And despite that sharp and painful tactical defeat on the ground of North Korea, the United States, as he saw it, and he was right, it did have sufficient power to do just that, if it were to be thrown into the war. And this phase of the Korean War is really, it's marked by a very unique spat between President Truman and MacArthur. Basically, what General MacArthur was doing was trying to usurp the authority of the president and act on his own behalf. He was being insubordinate. And really what MacArthur wanted to do is he saw the United States arsenal of military nuclear weapons as something that should be used. If you're a military guy, you want to use the tools at your disposal. The problem is the only person who is authorized to use them and the only person who ever has used them in a non-testing manner is President Truman. So while MacArthur is trying to escalate everything, Truman is trying to keep everything under control because the problem that was worrying everyone in Washington, it wasn't really as much what was happening in the frozen wasteland of North Korea, but it was what was happening in the chancelleries and the parliaments of the communist nations around the world. Essentially, their biggest fear was that they could never be sure that the start of World War III was not happening right before their eyes. And so while they were trying to quell this rising concern that World War III was happening, General MacArthur was continually writing these gloomy reports that were regularly sent from this time forward in the war, and they were written with the motive of influencing United States policy. And, you know, he's the general, not the policymaker. And that is one of the issues here that we see with the Korean War is this dichotomy of the civilian leadership deciding the goals and the military leadership is given the goals and has to do them. That's how war works. And now we're seeing a military leader trying to force his policy decisions and dip his toes into both buckets of water. And in MacArthur's defense, he he felt like he was handcuffed. You, If you're a military leader and you have tools at your disposal you're not allowed to use, well, that's got to be frustrating to say the least. And essentially what MacArthur wanted was political decisions and strategic plans that would permit him to fully engage the Chinese enemy, and he continued to hint and ask for them. What Truman decided was that until the United Nations clarified its position or decided to support a major U.S. move, it seemed best not to sacrifice men trying to hold what was already a clearly tenuous position in North Korea. So the new UN plan was now to try to hold a line across South Korea, north of the city of Seoul, or if worse came to worse, to hold two beachheads, one in the Seoul and Chon area and the other in the old Pusan perimeter. And what that means on the battlefield is that while the overall numbers of the Allied forces nearly matched the Chinese, at the point of impact where the battle was happening, the disparity was overwhelming. The Chinese just completely would hoard these groups of people up and send them across. But because the UN and US forces decided to pull back and hold that line, the terrain made these battles a series of what was known to be called the Indian fights. And while one American division was cut to pieces, others just a few miles across the mountains were enjoying relative peace and quiet. They had no idea of the carnage that was happening just next door. 
And so when they got the orders to hold the line and pull back a little bit, understandably so, the American commanders were eager to get out of these horrible mountains and back to where they could fight again in modern civilized fashion. And the age-old problem of moving a army comes into play again. The logistics gave a serious disadvantage to the Chinese army. Geography began to exert its influence in reverse. So where you had the Americans stretched out too far, now the Chinese were pushing and they were on the offensive. But they were stretched out too far and they couldn't get the supplies they needed to their own army. The difference in North Korea and South Korea of the terrain, it was still very broken up, but it was passable for vehicles. And in a narrow part of the peninsula, Americans and South Korean army could throw a continuous line from coast to coast, and they could protect their flank on either side. So the UN supply lines were shortened and improved, and then the Chinese military forces, they have the abbreviation of the CCF, they inherited a logistical nightmare. The CCF's guns, ammunitions, and supplies had to be brought down from the Yalu River mountain range under constant air bombardment over horrible roads and on a limited amount of transports available. The CCF had manpower, including thousands of Korean laborers, and they could live on very little, but there is a limit to the operations of an army that has to bear its ammunition hundreds of miles over mountains, mainly by muscle power. And soon this led to a renewed vigor of battle because the UN and United States forces were able to fight again. Even though they were ready to fight and able to fight again, the problem again comes with their orders and what they wanted to do as far as the military leadership in Washington. And perhaps the best way to sum up this whole dichotomy of Truman versus MacArthur is Harry S. Truman's own words when he says, quote, I was left with one simple conclusion. General MacArthur was ready to risk general war. I was not. End quote. And so the first couple of weeks after this massive Chinese intervention in Korea, they were a time of crisis, not just in Korea, but in virtually every single government in the world. Truman issued a press statement on November 30th of 1950, and he said, quote, Recent developments in Korea confront the world with a serious crisis. We have committed ourselves to the cause of a just and peaceful world order through the United Nations. We stand by that commitment. End quote. So Truman was really making it clear that further moves like the attacks on the Chinese mainland blockades or bombing, they all depended on the reaction of the United Nations. The United States wasn't going to be the sole attacker starting World War III. And then in a response to a question in a press conference, Truman affirmed that the atom bomb still remained in the United States arsenal of weapons. And what this did, in effect, was seal the policy of United States atomic warfare until this very day as I sit here and record this. He continued to say that he was the one who would give the authorization, and if he did, MacArthur would pick the targets. And to this day, the president is the one who controls that arsenal. And one thing that came from this whole press conference, it cleared the air. The U.S. government clearly understood where its major allies sat on the question of what to do with China. And they learned that above all else, the entire world wished to avoid general war, and atomic war in particular. It was at this point in the war that the allies for the United States, which had originally supported this motion to go into Korea and support this battle for democratic freedom, they found themselves in a position they really didn't want to be in, and the United States realized that about their allies as well. In order to get an idea of what to do next in that December of 50, Harry Truman dispatched the Army Chief of Staff, J. Lawton Collins, to Korea to meet with MacArthur and discuss the options moving forward. When Collins returned, he said that MacArthur, the Supreme Commander, essentially saw three possible courses of action. One was to continue the war in Korea, as before, under limiting restrictions. The second course was to enlarge the conflict by the bombing of the Chinese mainland, blocking the coast, and setting Chiang Kai-shek free with American support to fight both in Korea and South China, giving communist China more than it bargained for. And the third course would be to get the CCF to agree to remain north of the 38th parallel and to make an armistice upon that basis. Under UN supervision, of course. 
And it would come as no surprise that MacArthur told Collins he personally favored the second course, which was bombing them back to the Stone Age. And what Truman learned was disturbing to him. He learned that his thinking and the thinking of MacArthur, they were widely divergent of each other. Truman thought that course number two would inevitably lead to a huge general war, not only with China, but also Russia. And it wouldn't sit idly by while Asia was being humbled by U.S. might. And here is where the humongous problem really occurs. He understood that MacArthur had a perfect right to make his views known to his commander-in-chief, but the problem was that very quickly after this, MacArthur began to make his views known to everyone in the world. And on December 29th, MacArthur sent a message to the Joint Chiefs that he desired permission to blockade the China coast and attack airfields in Manchuria. Of course, he stated that he didn't fear the Chinese would be a problem being provoked. He considered the U.S. already at war with China as far as he was concerned. He stated that if his wishes weren't granted, the Korean peninsula should be evacuated. And what happened after this was a somewhat of a back and forth of cables and wires between Truman and MacArthur, essentially arguing like children would argue, really. The United States, Truman told MacArthur, must continue the defense of South Korea while at the same time it was consolidating the defense of Europe. And remember, this was just five years after World War II. Europe was still in shambles. So on March 20th, Truman and the Joint Chiefs sent a cable to MacArthur saying that they were prepping a peace arrangement. And MacArthur would send a message back that no further restrictions should be placed on his command, since those already in force no bombing of Manchurian bases or diversions against the mainland of China, they precluded the possibility of clearing North Korea anyway, as he saw it. And what happened next was a truly unprecedented event that had never taken place in history before it, much less in the history of the United States. The General of the Army, General Douglas MacArthur, America's Supreme Commander in the field, issued a statement on March 24th, 1951, without any prior warning to Washington, and he issued it to the public. He said, quote, Operations continue according to schedule and plan. We have now substantially cleared South Korea of organized communist forces. It is becoming increasingly evident that the heavy destruction along the enemy lines of supply caused by our round-the-clock massive air and naval bombardment has left his troops in the forward battle area deficient in requirements to sustain his operations. Of even greater significance than our tactical successes has been the clear revelation that this new enemy, Red China, of such exaggerated and vaunted military power, lacks the industrial capacity to provide crucial items necessary to the conduct of modern war. Formerly, his great numerical potential might have well filled this gap, but with the development of existing methods of mass destruction, numbers alone do not offset such deficiencies. End quote. And if you need help reading between the lines of what he's saying, he is basically saying to the world in a public statement, China may have some numbers, but they don't have a nuclear bomb. We do, and we are the big kid and the bully on the playground. I mean, try to imagine if that had happened today. Think of a military leader issuing to the public without any prior warning or approval from the government that he knows that we have the atom bomb and they don't. He's making an open threat to start a nuclear war. Understandably so, everyone panicked. And they panicked because MacArthur had just delivered Red China an ultimatum. He was not even subtly hinting that the full power of the U.S. and its allies might be brought to bear against the Chinese homeland. And when Truman read this statement, he went flush with anger. MacArthur's announcement was a challenge to the authority of the president under the Constitution to make foreign policy. He was trying to influence the policy himself. And under the Constitution of our country, no soldier has that privilege. So Harry Truman resolved to relieve General Douglas MacArthur of his command. And when the next evidence of MacArthur's insubordination arose, Truman's mind was already made up. But what occurred on April 5th of 1951, it in effect allowed Truman no other course, even if he didn't want to. And on that date, Joe Martin, who was the leader of the Republican opposition to Truman in the House, the Congress, he rose and he read a personal letter from MacArthur. 
an excerpt of that letter clearly shows that MacArthur had that disdain for the way the United States was treating Europe in his eyes versus Asia. Part of it said, quote, It seems strangely difficult for some to realize that here in Asia is where the communist conspirators have elected to make their play for for global conquest, and that we have joined the issue thus raised on the battlefield, that here we fight Europe's war with arms, while the diplomats there still fight it with words. There is no substitute for victory. And whether or not he was right or wrong, MacArthur's letter was clear in subordination. Everyone in the Truman administration agreed that the administration was facing a very serious threat to their administration and the de- democratic structure of America. And on March 24th at 3.15 p.m., the president signed an order that would relieve General MacArthur of all his several commands and replaced him with Lieutenant General Matthew B. Ridgway. In a presidential announcement to the country and the world, he informed everyone that MacArthur was no longer the great leader of the Pacific Army and the conquester of Korea, and essentially the world kind of was able to take a deep breath and sigh a great sigh of relief. In a presidential announcement to the world, Harry Truman said, quote, Full and vigorous debate on matters of national policy is a vital element in the constitutional system. It is fundamental, however, that military commanders must be governed by the policies and directives issued to them. In time of crisis, the consideration is particularly compelling. General MacArthur's place in history as one of our greatest commanders is fully established. The nation owes him a debt of gratitude for the distinguished and exceptional service he has rendered. And for that reason, I repeat my regret at the necessity for action I feel compelled to take in his case. He finished it with saying, quote, The free nations have united their strength in an effort to prevent a third world war. That war can come if the communist leaders want it to come, but this nation and its allies will not be responsible for its coming. End quote. And a storm erupted across America. It was indecisive as the one that had whipped the Korean front up. Where MacArthur went, millions would cheer him back home. But even those who screamed in the crowds, they weren't really sure what they were screaming for or against. General MacArthur basically went on a tour of America before the houses of Congress and he would speak to them. They had never heard MacArthur speak. This was in a day and age where technology was nowhere near where it was today, obviously, But everyone only knew him as a legend, and they would stand transfixed at his eloquence as it was broadcast around the world. Eventually, though, MacArthur would fade away in retirement, and that would be the end of his legacy. And in those soggy, just now turning green from spring hills of Korea, the war would go on. And it was a terrible war at that. Now, if you were fighting in the war and you were on the front lines, you were undergoing excruciating battle in terrible conditions. But the real nightmare for most men on the field was to be captured. The Chinese captors treated their prisoners of war horrifically. For example, after that ambush at the city or town of Kunuri, the men who were wounded had received no medical treatment except for the little that they could give themselves. And the Chinese would march them. They would only march during the dark. And it was a chilling miserable evening, and the men were forced outside, and from sundown to sunup, they were marching north. They would only receive one meal a day, which was a handful of corn boiled in water, and that single daily meal was fed to them in their canteen cups. Some of the men who had lost or thrown their stuff away, they had to eat out of their caps or from their hands like animals. So each day, when dusk would come, they were forced out into the stinging, freezing wind to march north until light would break from the east. They only moved at night because they feared the UN power, which was still ranging over all of North Korea despite the retreat of the land armies, and they kept the prisoners on the road because they had taken far more POWs than had been anticipated, and they really didn't know what else to do with them. And under the terrible pressure of those freezing nights, the meager diet, and those awful conditions some of the American soldiers just began to give up. Very quickly, all of them were exhausted, and a great deal of them were just sick. In the account of one man named Sergeant Schlichter, 
He said that they were worn out and miserable and hopeless, and as they gave up, they just started crying. I can't imagine that type of animosity and struggle and grief that you're dealing with. Sergeant Schlichter said that one young boy just gave up completely, and he said to him, quote, Sergeant, I cannot go on, end quote. And Schlichter tried to argue him into keeping going, but the boy just wouldn't move. The Chinese guards eventually came up to their spot in the line, and surprisingly, they were relatively considerate. They didn't shoot him or bayonet him as he thought they would. They brought him a sled. And all night long, they were marching up and down a mountain on its far side. The men would take turns dragging the man who just couldn't go on anymore. And in the dawn, when the stooped, limping party halted underneath the harsh command of their guards, the face of the man who had been pulled on the sled was white with frost. He had frozen to death during that night. And it's stories like Sergeant Schlichter's that make you realize how terrible this must have been, because as the long line of bereaved men was weaving its way through the valley, men were just falling out left and right. And then he said, suddenly, a very, very skinny dog, which was a collie, it was running up and down the column, and it was barking very happily. Sergeant Charles Schlichter remembers the dog would come up to sniff these Americans' smells he'd never smelled before, and he held out his hand for the animal to soothe it. Schlichter remembers that that night, he and his men ate roast dog. And the other men would let Schlichter, who did the honors of making the kill, have the largest piece. Most of them were ill with malnutrition, dysentery, untreated combat wounds, and above all, they were hopeless. Some of them were already going a little bit crazy. These were Americans, and they were still men, but it was in this valley that they would pause in, in this dirty mining camp, it came to be known later as Death Valley, the Chinese accomplished one terrible thing in war. Little by little, they took away the manhood of their prisoners. And while these men were enduring a hellish captivity of unspeakable hardships and trials, the war was still raging on. The first part of April 1951, the combined United States and UN forces, they now were half a million men strong, and they had crossed the parallel again in most places. Although the CCF was badly bleeding from a lot of wounds that were inflicted by air superiority, naval superiority, and just overall ground action, they were rushing more and more troops in North Korea as fast as they could until their total strength reached three quarters of a million men. Now, I'm no math expert. Obviously, I studied history, and anyone who knows me might get a chuckle out of me saying that math is not my strong suit to say the least, but that's a 250,000 man disadvantage that the UN forces were under. Needless to say, the Chinese had a numerical superiority that they thought gave them the overall initiative of the war. And because of this, they began to plan what they called first step, fifth phase offensive. It would concentrate on the western portion of the lines with the overall objective of capturing the South Korean capital of Seoul, 35 miles to the south of the 38th parallel. And while they were doing this, the 8th Army kept making somewhat limited attacks until the third week of April when its forces were 10 miles above the 38th parallel, everywhere except for Kaesong. It was a cautious but confident probe of these CCF lines. In General Ridgway, he had planned no general sweeping attack, but he was determined to see how far the 8th Army could go. And as I just said, it was April and spring was coming to Korea. And I'm sure that the overall majority of the men on the ground were happy to see it come. They had just gone through a frozen hell on earth type of situation in the winter battles. And so I'm sure that the sight of green grass and blooming fields of azalea were a brief respite from the dread of winter and a glimpse of beauty back in their world. But in a theme that is so current throughout this Korean War conflict, when there was something beautiful, it quickly turned into a scene of horror. As the rains thawed the snow and the ice began to melt and the flowers began to bloom, the skulls of the men that had been killed during the winter 
loosened by all that rain and thawing, began rolling down the hillsides of the North Korean countryside and would rest in the middle of these fields of blooming azaleas, creating a scene of beautiful horror. And so with spring, Korea brought not a rebirth, but it brought a scene of further death. And not only was it just a scene of death, but on the 22nd of April, the Chinese began their offensive and struck the 17,000-yard front line of the British Brigade with six of their divisions with more than 50,000 men heading that attack. The American 3rd Division was just to the right of that British Brigade receiving that frontal attack, and they had dropped back to the Imjin River at the start of the offensive. What they had was good position, and better yet, they had confidence. And confidence was something so lacking up to this point in the Korean War, and it stems from poor leadership. And perhaps in one of the most important facets of war as far as being a successful military in war, these men who were ordered to hold and fight, they showed what soldiers can do when they have learned new discipline and they know how to wield their weapons when they have proper leadership. And they rebuffed this Chinese attack in one triumphant shout from a fire-swept bloody hill that was recorded on the 25th of April sums up pretty well the actions of all these men. They said, quote, we're holding them by God we're holding them, end quote. This was a new scene for the UN and US forces in Korea. This initial freezing panic of being attacked, it lasted only a few minutes. These artillery men who had been well-trained now were tightly disciplined and they were led superbly. They suddenly realized that they could hold their own. And within a few hours, the entire battalion pulled back to a safer position beyond the sniper range. And as Marine tanks growled in to relieve them, They hadn't asked for help yet. They didn't even need it. And after the scene of battle was finished, all told, the American unit had lost only four men killed, 11 wounded, and lost no equipment. Around the perimeter of the whole battalion, the Marines reported that they found 179 Chinese dead soldiers. The first step, 5th offensive, was failing. And it was a long way from the ambush at Kunuri when we first met the Chinese in battle, Not in time or distance, but it was a long way in the new spirit in the hearts of these American men fighting on the ground. Overall, for this first step, fifth phase offensive thrusting towards Seoul, it had failed. At least 15,000 Chinese soldiers were killed along the Imjin River, and their best offensive could only achieve a slight realignment of the UN lines. This was a new force that the Chinese were going up against. This was a group of men that were well-trained and had good leadership, but really they had confidence in themselves and their unit for the first time in this conflict. It goes directly back to what Dick Winters was saying, having self-discipline and having the right type of pride from the top down. It's a perfect example of the writings, the Latin writings of Vegetius, I believe that's how you pronounce it, from the military institutions of the Romans so many years before this, and he was talking about the necessity of providing soldiers with defensive arms as well as instructions on how to use them, and he said, quote, For it is certain men fight with greater courage and confidence when they find themselves properly armed for defense, end quote. In arming your men for defense does not stop just with actual armaments. You arm your men with defense and the capability of defense by providing them with good leadership and training. And although this first step fifth phase offensive had failed miserably, United Nations intelligence warned of troop and supply movement that a new CCF offensive was brewing, and this time it would fall against General Ned Allman's 10th Corps. We're going to take a pause in this story for just a moment to touch on one of the biggest issues of this and really Vietnam, which is the failure of the United States leadership, a massive and critical failure, which rested on their belief and their wholehearted opinion that overwhelming air superiority and bombing someone back to the Stone Age could relinquish their will to fight or survive. 
The lesson they failed to glean from just before this in World War II, when the Germans were bombing London and England with everything they had, they just failed to look back a few years before this and understand that that bombing, that didn't kill the will of the country to fight. It strengthened them. It gave them resolve. It gave them a new tonic of battle, and it gave them a purpose to rally around. The Chinese, just as many others in military history before them, had learned to fight to the, to the field that was in front of them. The Chinese had to learn how to fight and live under a hostile sky. They would cling to the mountains. They dug deep underground. They moved at night when it was difficult for even the night-flying fighter bombers to seek them out under that harsh terrain. And the lesson that we failed to learn is that bombing someone back to the Stone Age doesn't help if the battle you're fighting has a military against you that is already living and fighting like they are in the Stone Age to begin with. On May 16th of 1951, after night had cloaked the sky, the Chinese launched their second step, fifth phase offensive. It was known as the Battle of So Yang, and the soldiers of the 2nd Division remembered it ever afterwards as the May Massacre. And on that day, May 16th of 51, the 3rd and 9th Army groups of the CCF combined to move 137,000 Chinese and 38,000 North Koreans southward. The Chinese attacked, and they struck fire such as they had never faced before. Infantrymen this time would hold to their hilltops. Tanks would move along the corridors of the valley with their machine guns and cannons. Tank gunners and artillerymen would fire until they were either exhausted from loading shells or the tubes were close to burning out entirely. And on the right flank of the division, finally, after a day, the advance of the Chinese was stopped. And shortly after dark on that 17th of May, waiting in a cold mountain fog, King Company of the 2nd Division heard the sound of bugles. Soon, the men on Bunker Hill, which was the nickname of the hill they were occupying, heard the Chinese at their first wire barrier. Several mines exploded, and the Chinese opened up fire on that hill. The men were ordered to hold Bunker Hill at all cost, and in a thunderous small arms firefight, which are always so brutal, the brutality of close combat is something that I've heard from conversations with men who've been part of it. It's something you can't simply grasp the reality of what it's actually like until you are in it. And all of the men who I've talked to who have been in it have said it is the last thing you can ever hope for in your life. Either way, Captain Brownell had organized his reserve platoon for a counterattack to hurl the Chinese off the hill. Forming a long skirmish line, they advanced through the dark, firing at the Chinese, and they had a lot of white phosphorus grenades hurling them into the bunkers and the trenches as they passed. And as each grenade exploded on the hill, the advancing infantry of the Chinese would stand out sharply against the ghastly white light of burning men. And in a perfect example of good leadership, this Captain Brownell watched this horde of Chinese men running forward towards Bunker Hill to rebuff his attack, and he called for artillery. Because he had good communication with them this time, because he had set it up beforehand, he told his platoon leaders what he planned to do. Then he asked for artillery to rain down variable time shells directly on the hill. The shells would come in and they would blow up a few feet above the ground and it would spray the whole area with sizzling shards of hot metal. And it was recorded in the Division Operations Journal that 2,000 rounds of 105 millimeter shell burst over Bunker Hill within just eight minutes. But that didn't stop the Chinese. They came again, even as they climbed over their own dead comrades. This time, when they were firmly on the hill he was defending, Brownell called for every inch of that hill to be covered with fire, and the 38th Field Artillery that night would fire 10,000 rounds alone. Nothing above the ground that night would live. And the reason that Brownell and his men survived is because before this, he had ordered them to build these defensive structures that were so well fortified, they thought they had no idea. They were actually mad at him for what he was making them do. But because they had built such good structures, they were untouched. 
and at dawn, the CCF broke, and they streamed north, leaving only their dead behind. In just two days after this, General Ned Allman would realize that the second stage, fifth phase offensive, was contained and rebuffed. So by launching a massive and powerful counterattack, almost before the end of what was to be the most spectacular defensive stand of the war, the Tenth Corps had suddenly and sharply changed the course of the war. Now the Chinese had completely lost the initiative, and worse, they had been hurt almost beyond the point of recovery. Against the second division which the Chinese faced just during the month of May, an estimated 65,000 Chinese and North Koreans had died from the guns of the U.S. 2nd Division. In one valley alone, where the artillery had done what it was supposed to do, 5,000 corpses were counted in that valley. And at the end of the May Massacre, the entire 8th Army again moved north, and when it stopped, it would not be stopped with guns, but with words. And this marks the beginning of the phase of the Korean War, which historian T.R. Fahrenbach in his book titles very bluntly, Blundering. And it seems that the most appropriate adjective you can give to describe, or the most appropriate name to give this entire phase or section of the story, is truly a story of blunder. At this point in the war, moving against China itself was politically unfeasible in the UN, and the United States truly did not want any hot war with Red China. This was the beginning of the Cold War, obviously, so making that move had large implications. And General Matthew Ridgway, who was well aware of the processes that had brought him his promotion to a four-star general, was, unlike his predecessor, very content to take direction from Washington. And what Washington wanted was to seek any means out of the Korean conflict that might be achieved without surrender and with honor. And what they had found themselves in with this Korean conflict was that it had escalated from a small, limited war to a very large, though still limited, war. And it had poised the world because of all the talk of nuclear weapons. As far as they saw it, they were on the brink of a general holocaust. And that is a point that I think gets completely skipped over in most high school history courses, or especially when just talking about the Korean War. This was the first version of the Cuban Missile Crisis, or the first version of the Berlin Crisis or any type of nuclear concern. This was the first time in the in the nuclear the post-nuclear era where the world was looking on wondering what was going to happen because for the first time weapons had been created that posed a threat to every person on the globe not just near the conflict. So when I say that the world was on the brink of a general holocaust I do not say that lightly and I don't think it should be glossed over as much as it is in current history classes, but I'm not a school superintendent, so that's not really my call. However, back to the story, what the U.S. wanted was, essentially, they were wondering if a ceasefire could be made along the 38th parallel. And on June 2nd, Dean Acheson had said that there were actually two problems for this piece. One was political and one was militarily. While the long-term political approach of the U.S., which desired a united and free independent Korea hadn't changed, the immediate problem of concern to Washington was the stopping of the shooting with the assurances it would not begin again. And on June 7th, in response to vigorous grilling by a Senate committee, Acheson further stated that any reliable armistice based on that parallel would be within the bounds of reason to accept to the U.S. And so now the U.S. had come full cycle, back from its position of October of 50 to its previous position in June. The goal was containment, not victory. And on the other side of the table, it was very clear to the Soviet forces and observers that the CCF was not going to win in a decision in South Korea, and that they couldn't even halt the slow and steady United Nations advance northward. And it was also clear that continuing a hot war in the Far East was getting Western nerves riled up and it was hastening the slow rearmament of Europe under NATO. The West obviously desired peace, but the continued communist intransience could lend only to unite the Western allies against them in the long run. So both sides at this point desired a way out of the conflict they had created for themselves. 
And one of the biggest problems with this proposed ceasefire was that the Republic of Korea, basically South Korea in the future, but the Republic of Korea was left as the biggest loser. It saw no honor whatsoever in the proposed ceasefire because it left its people ravaged and still divided. A settlement along the 38th parallel, it meant that separation of Korea into two blocks for as long as any man could count would last possibly for centuries. So, of course, the still leader of South Korea, Syngman Rhee, he was spurred not only by economic and national reasons to oppose peace now, but by the same reasons that bound Europe's leaders into an emotional straitjacket in World War I when the Great War stalemated, and it seemed sensible to end it. To end the war after such wholesale sacrifice with nothing but the status quo was more than he, Syngman Rhee, or his Koreans could bear to be okay with. And a result of this was that, with different goals, essentially, neither Washington or the Seoul Korea government fully trusted each other. And on July 1st of 1951, agreeing to a meeting, not at sea as Matthew Ridgway had desired, but at Kaesong, Kim Il-sung sent out a radio broadcast agreeing to the meeting. And until that day, on July 1st of 51, after several years and long months of enduring war, this was the first time that the UN and US intelligence learned the name of Kim Il-sung. He was nameless until that day. Should just go to show you, if you don't even know the leader of the communist nation you're fighting, it should make you think about reevaluating your own intelligence situations. But that's neither here nor there. And the UN nations, the command of the UN nations, they didn't really care to be technical about where they met. They decided to agree on Kay Song. And it was here at Kay Song that the UN, the United States, and the world really learned about communist negotiations. They would never propose anything, not even a truce site, without it being to their own advantage. So from the American and UN point of view, the sole purpose of the meeting at Kaesong was to end the bloodshed and create some sort of machinery to supervise an armistice. Once this was done, an entirely separate body would sift through the political and territorial questions left by the Korean situation, but in an atmosphere of peace, it would be done. And another lesson that should have been learned from this in the Vietnam era, Americans, even the knowledgeable Dean Acheson, had once again tried to separate peace and war into their own neat little compartments, much to their own chagrin. Along with the compartmentalization failure of peace and war being separate, the men there at Kaesong also learned that the communist delegation intended not only to discuss the ceasefire, but everything up to and including the kitchen sink. And back to the selection of the site of Kaesong, which was in communist hands at that time, but below the parallel, one of the very few spots in Korea where they were below the parallel and in possession of territory, they forced the UN negotiators to enter communist territory displaying white flags as if they were coming to surrender. They seated the head of the US delegation, Admiral Joy, in a chair, which was substantially lower than the leader of the communist delegation, Nam Ills, and the enemy showed that nothing was too small or trivial to be overlooked as long as it accrued to his advantage. So as best they could without sabotaging the talks, the UN command began to fight for their own interests. Its delegates had come in good faith to make an honest end to the killing with the settlements to come later. The tragedy of the talks was that the communists intended merely to transfer the war from the battlefield, where they were losing, to the conference tables, where they thought they might be able to win something yet. They had transferred their war entirely over to the table, and now they were pretty much happy waging it as they were at any point during this war. And although they were trying to delay this forever, in the green and muddy hills of Korea, the war was not over. It had begun its last terrible, blundering phase. And I guess this would typically require some sort of Spoiler alert. For all practical purposes, the Korean War ended on June 30th of 1951 when Matthew Ridgway, the commander of the UN forces, radioed his willingness to discuss truce terms with the communist forces. And that end was a stalemate. But it was from this time forward, 
that the political reality in Korea drastically diverged from the military reality, and the frustration of American soldiers would continue to grow. And from this point on, until the end of the fighting, the political considerations, both international and domestic, would take precedent or priority over any and all combat operations. And what that translated to for the generals on the battlefield was because of these peace negotiations that were going back and forth, they were unwilling to strike for victory, but they were equally unable to clutch this elusive dove of peace that the Communist Party would put forth and then take back time and time again. American commanders and American government leaders began to just become overtly frustrated, and the situation was extremely hard for the generals on the ground. Their new orders essentially seemed to read, fight on, but don't fight too hard, don't lose, but don't win either, just kind of hang out and hold the line while we kind of muddle through these negotiations. And as hard as it was for the generals and commanders on the ground, it was harder still for the riflemen and the infantry and tankermen and the weapons squads dug in all along the scarred, dirty hills of Korea. And now, more than any other point in this war, they knew less than ever why they were dying. It's a classic, and part of my French here, shit or get off the pot situation. Either go in and wage war, or don't. And for the men on the ground, I mean, you're, you're not going to find a single man who is going to be eager to give up his life for an inconsequential reason. And there is absolutely no honor only the most tragic type of irony to being the last man killed in a war. So when the advance had stopped in June, it had not been along any carefully pre-planned battle lines. There were bulges and salients and areas of no man's land along the entire front. And from a military standpoint, corrections were needed. So as the talks would drone on at Kaesong, the UN command became more convinced that the enemy was just stalling, and the commanders agreed that a little bit of pressure, judiciously applied of course, might have a good effect. So by the 1st of August, they were ready to apply such pressure. The attacks that they were planning would serve two purposes. Essentially, it would pressure the Communist Party into sincerity at these peace talks, and it would keep the 8th Army, the army that was defending the front lines, on its toes. Because one of the worst things you can do with an army is let it get stagnant or complacent. And in modern war, short of ending the fighting itself, combat troops have only three means of escape from the action. And those three ways of getting out of the combat were being simply rotated out, going insane from battle fatigue, shell shock, PTSD, whatever you want to call it, being injured to the point where you need to be taken out, or of course, dying. And in modern war, there are no winter quarters like there were at Valley Forge, or lengthy withdrawals from action until the harvests are in. And in Korea, by early 1951, thousands of wounded men had been returned to action, and more thousands of unwounded risked their lives every single day, month in and month out. And, of course, you rotate an army to keep it fresh, so all over Korea, those who were left of the earliest men to arrive there began to go home in dribbles that soon turned into what felt like floods as the new men came in to replace them. And after the beginning of these truce talks, and you can hardly blame them, the primary interest of every man in the Korean theater of war was going home. I mean, it couldn't be anything other than that. If you hear, as a soldier on the front lines, sleeping on the ground in a hole with bullets whizzing over your head, if you hear that truce talks are on, how could you think of anything else? This was a war that they didn't want to be in, and to make it worse, at this point they didn't know why they were there at all. Needless to say, the new troops coming in had a impressive lack of enthusiasm to be there, and even worse than that, they were green. The kind of lessons that troops need to fight this kind of war really could only be learned in Korea. In a period of few months, 
the complexion of the American army had changed. It's very easy to have an army be replenished or have replacements come in, and all of a sudden you have a brand new army without the experience that a army needs to be successful in war. On July 1st, approximately 750,000 Chinese and North Koreans held the communist battle line. They began this war with the cream of the crop of the communist armies, and they had been destroyed at this point. Replacements were coming down the mountains as well for the North and the Chinese armies, and they were very recent inductees. They were impressed against their will from rice fields and village. Most of them were untrained, and in a lot of cases, they were completely unarmed and badly clothed. Now, in a modern war, in a modern army, that would be ludicrous to impress these men into the army with no weapons at all. But although they were fighting a modern war, they weren't fighting it in a modern style. These men might not be experts at war, but they were experts at hard work, and they had been doing it all of their lives. Their leaders set them to work digging. They entered mountains from the rear slope, tunneling all the way through to make gun positions opening on the front. They dug bunkers in which a company could safely and warmly bivouac in. They dug so deep into the earth that no conventional gun or cannon could reach them. And when they had dug all of that, they went backwards and dug a new defensive line, and one beyond that, stretching into the north. They dug a line such as the world has never seen, ten times the depth of any in World War I. And I know I haven't covered World War I on this podcast yet, but that that's a staggering feat right there. World War I is famous for trench warfare, and these laborers in this army dug lines 10 times the depth of any World War I trench. They dug positions that could, and they assumed might have to, stand against nuclear explosion. This army might have been fighting a modern war, but they were doing it on their terms, and they were, ar- they were pressing themselves into this war using tactics from the Stone Age. And if you try to bomb someone back to the Stone Age... Well, you can't really find any success if they are already there. In these hills, artillery became essentially ineffective, and air air power and air raids were they were so ineffective they were hardly even considered. In a four day battle for Hill eleven seventy nine, both sides lost heavily, and when that hill fell, another hill lay beyond it, or three more, and it formed steep ridges several thousand yards long. Now, this had zero value to anyone on either side except as a vantage point for superior observation over the defensive line hostile to whoever held it. But because they were just kind of maneuvering without any real grand purpose, since it was there, it seemed like a reason enough just to take it because it was there. And it seemed an excellent opportunity to send in the ROC, ROK, Republic of Korean Army, which was newly revitalized to kind of show the world what it could do. Unlike the rock soldiers of the early parts of this war, these rock soldiers were brave, and they tried hard. They advanced onto steep slopes plowed by a maze of deep trenches, thorny with hidden bunkers and traps. And remember, these bunkers were fortified to withstand air and artillery pounding, and some had room for two platoons of North Korean army soldiers. Others would shelter small cannons and mortars. Dug into rubble of a partially wooded slope and obscured by morning mists, the North Korean positions were almost impossible to detect until it was too late. The Republic of Korean soldiers, in 10 days, had taken a thousand killed and wounded. And seeing the decimation of the rock soldiers and the desperateness of the North Korean army defenses, American observers reported to Major General Ruffner that they needed help. Ruffner called Lieutenant General James Van Fleet for permission to move a new infantry division onto the ridge with the Republic of Korean Regiment. And on the 27th of August, the 9th Infantry attacked Peak 983 on that ridge. And they went forward with an utter confidence that somehow the Republic of Korean soldiers had managed to screw up an easy job. And what they found was that was not the case at all. 
the fighting was so fierce that the artillery they called in for support just to help them with this simple task of a small hill, they fired 451,979 rounds of artillery. The ridge turned into a flaming hell of twisted steel and searing flames. The trees would be splintered into stubs, and fresh earth would appear everywhere from artillery rounds digging into the earth almost as if they were digging graves for the soldiers they were trying to help. And even though they had some of the most impressive defensive fortifications you can conceive of, the North Koreans did die by the hundreds, but many of them were so deep in their bunkers no shelling would reach them until they came out too close with the advancing Americans. And they had artillery of their own, too, firing to protect the ridge. More artillery than any American had seen so far in the Korean War. And remember, this was a company that was through and through with new, green, untrained men and, worse, officers. So the 9th Infantry was no longer a team. And attacking onto the ridge, the situation grew worse by the minute. The first Company of the 9th Infantry, Able Company, took 100% casualties three days in a row. And if you're wondering how a company can take 100% casualties three days in a row, it's obviously, it's not all dead. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it's a combination of dead and wounded troops, but wounded troops being thrown back into rotation and getting wounded and then getting thrown back into rotation again and getting wounded. Three days running. New replacements were fed into the shattered company while they were still in action, and teamwork and cohesion became sporadic at best. And from the beginning of the history of warfare in mankind, conventional supporting weapons have not been invented to this day that can dislodge a stubborn enemy from a deliberately prepared position. So, as it still is pretty much today, the only way to reduce A long ridge was bunker by bunker at close range with rifles and grenades. And as I've mentioned so many times before, it was horrific and bloody work. In what this battle that all the news correspondents back home were calling Bloody Ridge by this point, what this battle really showed was that the new path of Korean warfare was being set, one that, unfortunately, especially to all that were alive in the First World War, resembled, more than anything, a hideous stalemate slaughter on the Western Front of World War I. This time it was in Korea in 1950. So pushing up against Bloody Ridge, the men of the 1st and 2nd of the 9th were being cut to pieces. The troops and their leaders were just brand new. They were brave, and like the Republic of Korean Army before them, they were trying their best. It just wasn't enough. Replacements would be wandering up to engaged units and getting killed the first hour before they could even report in. Finally, one general ordered replacements to be kept in the replacement company for at least a day and to have five or six days of special training before being sent into combat. And if you think I'm really hitting hard on just the the newness of these soldiers and how little time they had to acclimate to war, which I don't know if you can ever acclimate to war as a human, but... They weren't even given time to zero in their weapons. So how can you expect an army to operate if you can't even shoot straight? Literally, not figuratively, you cannot shoot straight. Finally, that same general that ordered them to be held in the replacement company also added a new order, which seems ridiculous to even have to make, but he ordered that they zero in their weapons or be given the time to do it before they enter combat. All said and done, on September 5th, the North Korean army voluntarily relinquished Bloody Ridge after they had lost an estimated 15,363 men. Of those, 4,000 of them were dead. I do not think that the enemy was fleeing. They just merely pulled back to positions on the next prominent ridgeline that ran perpendicular to the Bloody Ridge, about 1,500 yards to the north. So without any real Result to show for it, the North had lost 15,000, and the Republic of Korean Army more than 1,000, and the 2nd Division in that 9th Infantry, they lost 3,000 men to secure three insignificant hills of dirt among the hundreds that thrust up 
along the line in front of them, and that was the new type of stalemate war that Korea had become. On September 13th of 51, the 23rd Infantry moved against the seven-mile-long hill that became known as Heartbreak Ridge that was running perpendicular to Bloody Ridge where the North Koreans had withdrawn. And although they tried their best, the 2nd Division artillery could not even make a dent in these underground fortifications, although they did try, firing 229,724 rounds. And again, the fighting was close, brutal, and dangerous, while all around them mortars and artillery were just punishing everyone without any respite. Again and again, companies of the American 23rd fought their painful way up the slopes, blasting at bunkers, killing the enemy in their trenches, and again and again, they would reach the crests, exhausted, decimated, low on ammunition, and knocked off of that hill by a brand new, fresh, howling charge of North Korean troops. The carnage was so bad that companies would sometimes stand at less than 30 men before the fresh replacements would come in from Japan. Now, although the artillery wasn't doing anything for the men in the bunkers, when they would make a charge, it would help out tremendously, to say the least. They were killing the enemy at a ratio of pretty much 9 to 1 because of that American artillery, but to the men dying along the ridge, there was no real satisfaction in that. Few of them were even interested in the first place in killing North Korean peasants because, again, they didn't know why they were there and they had no fire in their bellies to be fighting a war for which they had no idea the purpose of was in the first place. And don't forget that while all of this was going on, all these bloody battles that really served legitimately no purpose, the peace talks were still going back and forth and back and forth making absolutely no progress. For 27 days, the 23rd Infantry would assault Heartbreak Ridge. They would take spots here and there, and then they'd lose them. They'd they'd take whole stretches of the hill, but they couldn't secure the whole ridge. Because they were up against an army from the North Koreans that would pour men in from the north without even counting how many they were sending. This set a new pattern that characterized most of the following battles that showed a disputed piece of terrain, generally just a small area of hills, where the fighting was hell itself. Artillery fire, like the world had never seen before, massing against single hills day after day. And so because of the limitation that the terrain set on the fighting area, the cycle of units being thrown forward haphazardly, those units then being cut to pieces so quick it was insane, and then being replaced. And the cycle continued over and over and over again. All the while, the peace talks are doing nothing, and everyone wants peace. These men were dying for nothing. And probably one of the most tragic parts of this whole cycle of death is that the enemy North Korean and Chinese forces were perfectly willing to fight to the death over a small piece of ground for what seemed like forever. It was almost like a kid's game of King of the Mountain, except this one was being played with blood in bullets, and whoever lost a hill would lose face or their own life. So after weeks of fighting for Heartbreak Ridge, it became pretty clear to the 2nd Division that it would have to be flanked to be attacked. And by October 15th, all maneuvers had broken the back of the defense of the Heartbreak Ridge because they started flanking it, and the North Korean Corps that held the ridge would not again be fit for action. On that bloody ridge, they, the North Korean army, had suffered more than 35,000 casualties. And the 2nd Division of the U.S. Army did not stop putting the pressure on. The ridge would be taken on October 25th, and as the men who took it came down that hill, they would be replaced by the U.S. 7th Division. And the real heartbreak wasn't just the ridge or in the dead and the wounded, all 5,600 of them, some of which the men of the 7th Division found wedged in bunkers and crevices, but the real heartbreak was that absolutely nothing had been accomplished by any of it. And back home, so soon after the high hopes had been raised by the peace negotiations, thousands would receive telegrams sent to the next of kin to inform them that 
of the worst possible news when it seemed like there was an end nearly in grasp. Needless to say, the public, the American public, had accepted the end of the war and pretty much what everyone knew was coming as far as a stalemate and no real end to the war, but the continued casualties were completely unacceptable. And just about a month after this, the UN command agreed to accept the communist proposal on the ceasefire line, provided that the armistice was signed within 30 days, and the communists eagerly assented. They had a 30-day reprieve and they utilized it by reinforcing their defensive lines in depth until they were almost impervious to any attack at all, with a flank that was firmly anchored on each side by the sea in broken ground, it would now require an effort equivalent to that of the Battle of the Somme or Verdun to dislodge them short of any nuclear weapons. And just to take a, a second here, I chose the Somme and the Verdun to to bring up a point that 300,000 French and British soldiers fell trying to breach the German fortifications just at the Somme, and there wasn't a single power left in the world that had a heart to accept such useless slaughter and probably never will again. And so the communists were dug in to a point that would require a cost no one was willing to pay in order to get them out. On November 27th, the ceasefire line and the present line of contact was formally ratified by each side, and initialed maps were exchanged. The communist delegate, they had a pretty much a whole part of what they wanted from the get-go. They had dissipated the danger of the UN march all the way up to China, or a disastrous military defeat on the field. And it was from this time forward, hurting really under the losses that they had taken in the hill battles of that summer, having agreed to a firm line and not wanting to really cost any more lives unnecessarily, the United States and UN forces would take no more large-scale offensive actions for the rest of the war. But the real tragedy was at the end of that 30-day period, the enemy was no sooner signing the armistice than he had been in July. Basically, he felt like he was free to delay as long as he wanted, and it would soon be apparent that that's what they intended to do, reaping whatever propaganda gains they could. So in Korea, the situation was that the United Nations had granted a sort of ceasefire, but there was absolutely no peace. And more than a year before these peace talks began, in Korea, there was just stalemate, neither side advancing, and neither one would retreat. Each side holding their own hills and valleys, but from November 51 on, the North Korean and Chinese forces became decidedly more aggressive than the United Nations. What they would do is they would just kind of patrol aggressively. They would launch limited attacks again and again and again. They would take the hills and the men occupying them, and they killed more men when the UN attacked to take its property back. So usually it was just minor action, except for the men who were swarming through shells of the Chinese or being pounded by artillery fire falling at the rate of hundreds of shells per minute. And one of the worst tragedies of this whole war, as if I haven't mentioned enough, is that there were exactly half as many men killed or wounded during the stalemate period as had been lost during the violent part of the war that surged up and down the peninsula. So take that into consideration for a moment. This was a stalemate, supposedly a ceasefire, that saw exactly half as many men killed during the entire rest of the war during just this little ceasefire stalemate. How awful of a taste in your mouth would you have had as a parent of a dead son over in Korea during what was supposed to be a ceasefire? And given everything I've just said about that conflict... It's no wonder at all why T.R. Fehrenbach, the historian that I mentioned earlier, labeled his final chapter, this chapter, or his chapter that goes over this period of the war, as blundering. Because surely this would be the clearest definition, and maybe even an understatement. The very last spring of the Korean War, which was in 1953, was one of the most violent and terrible of the entire conflict. 
But because at this point, everyone in the Western world, the non-communist side, considered waging war criminal at this point almost because of the horrible – it's horrible to ask men to die. And it's even worse if you're asking them to die for no reason whatsoever. It's it's borderline criminal. But because of this and because of the lines never really moving in the trench-type warfare, the public in the home fronts quickly began to lose interest in any of the reporting of the war. It seemed to them that just nothing was happening. Lines weren't moving. But every day and night, men were dying by bayonet, grenade, machine gun, in violent assaults, down trenches and bunkers, or by the deadly pounding of artillery, which continued to fall like rain out of the sky without any warning. As the North Korean and Chinese forces began becoming more aggressive on the battlefield, so too did the UN negotiations become more aggressive at the peace talks. And the last real issue that was stalling this entire debate and keeping this bloody war going was an issue of prisoners of war. Without dragging it on forever and getting too deep into it, then we need to go. The real issue was that because the communist nations were so brutal to their people and because they relied so heavily on propaganda and controlling the flow of information and what information there was, period, they wanted all of their POWs that were under the control of the UN or US forces to be returned to them and repatriated without question. Now, keep in mind, the UN and US forces had a vastly large number of POWs because it wouldn't be too hard to Understand that if you are a farmer plucked out of a field that is just trying to feed your family and you're forced to join an army that you don't want to join, or maybe you maybe you don't care at all, but it wouldn't be hard to understand that a surrender to the opposing side, which seems much more friendly and just a way to save your own life, might be the best solution. So they had prisoners... At least, I think I read somewhere that there were about 10 times as many prisoners as they expected. They had to put most of them on an island just off the coast of Korea because there were so many they couldn't build a prison for them. And it wouldn't be hard to imagine that most of these men probably didn't want to return to a communist nation that forced them into a war they didn't want to be in in the first place if they hadn't already been brutally oppressed by the communist regime enough. It would be horrifically embarrassing for the communist movement across the world at this point if none of their POWs or you know citizens wanted to go back. And in order to save face on a global level, they wanted all those people back without question. It was the only deadlock that was preventing truce at this point. And slowly but surely, whether or not the communists would publicly admit that their captured soldiers refused repatriation or not, the world began to become aware of it. And more and more of the world, all the way from Mexico to India, were becoming annoyed to say the least at this communist intransience. So now what had happened was the communists who were crying over and over again for their fervent desire for peace were increasingly being backed into a corner in which it was apparent they were now preferring a continued bloodshed to a propaganda defeat, and in so doing, they were getting the defeat anyways. And oddly enough, the one thing that happened that helped speed along the end of this bloodshed, and on March 5th of 1953, Joseph Stalin died. And because Stalin, like all good dictators, had never dared to plan for his own succession— but instead systematically destroyed anyone that was even remotely capable of replacing him, the monolithic structure of Russian communism suddenly seemed doomed altogether. And so a lot of things joined from that now moved the world toward great events. In the spring of 53, the leaders of the U.S. and the non-communist world wanted peace, and the communist leadership desperately needed it. And because they so desperately needed peace, they had no other choice but to actually negotiate. So now, with the communists and the UN in agreement, only the Republic of Korea stood in the way of armistice. And 
just like later in Vietnam, Sing Man Ri would play the role of despair and defiance in almost tanking these peace talks. And really what the tragedy of Sing Man Ri and South Korea was, was a simple one. They could not go on fighting without American support. Acceptance of the truce as the way it was, it would doom the Korean people to permanent division. And this entire conflict was started to unite the country. It eventually took the United States guaranteeing that South Korea would become a protected ward of the U.S. for Sing Man Ri to play ball. And after two years of just negotiations from which they had agreed upon for the, the line of truce that they had de- decided on day one of those peace talks two years earlier, so essentially they had been arguing over literally nothing except for POWs or stupid things like whose chair was taller and what shape of the table just like Vietnam, it all seemed to be coming to an end finally on June 4th of 1953. And after all that, each side had learned something about the other. The communists learned that the will of free men is not easily broken even when peace is their intent. And the West learned, for the first time really, that the communist world holds human life at absolutely no importance whatsoever, even if there is the smallest advantage to be gained. And it was basically for that knowledge and almost nothing else that many men of all nations had died. And on July 27th of 1953, both sides signed the agreement to cease fire. There was no more war, but at the same time, there was no peace. There was no victory. It was just called a ceasefire. It was a conflict that saw more than 2 million human beings dead. 40,000 of them were American soldiers and airmen in what was just a skirmish. Nothing more. Nothing had been won or gained except that the far frontier had been held. In summing up one of the biggest tragedies of the entire conflict period, T.R. Fahrenbach says in his book, quote, It rapidly became the most forgotten war in American history. There was little in it from near disastrous beginning to honorable but frustrating end that appealed to American sensibilities, because they cannot look back on it with any sense of satisfaction or even the haunted pride that a defeated nation sometimes finds. Americans prefer not to look back at at all. Yet men forget, as always, at their own peril. End quote. When I was planning out the ending for this story, I was reminded of a quote from Aristotle that was, quote, Almost all things have been found out, but some have been forgotten, end quote. And it was the Korean War that Americans learned to forget. All of it, the misery, the wastefulness, the courage of the men fighting it, the trauma that haunted them after. Millions of Americans would find no meaning in it, so they chose to forget it. And it is while people talk dismissively of the lessons of history that they ignore them. And the biggest lesson of this entire story of Korea is just that it happened at all. It's the lesson we should never forget. PodcastAdvocate.network.